Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 463 of the podcast and it is the last day of November as I record this in chilly Bath. Now the Christmas market is here which is basically festive carnage, it really is, uh, fueled by Glühwein, you know the uh, wonderful German mulled wine and lots of cauldrons of spirits. <laughs> It's very merry. Um, But all the locals take the back streets to avoid the tourist horde. It really is. It's so funny. Bath is normally very sedate and and, and then the Christmas market arrives and uh, yeah, all hell breaks loose. (laughs) Uh, And I was in London yesterday and um, walked along Regent Street, saw the Christmas angels. It's very festive. And a reminder that we are heading towards the end of the year. And in fact, the end of the decade, which is one of those. Uh, and it, you, you might have seen a few of the memes around uh, social media, people taking a picture from 2009 uh, and a picture from 2019. So, to, so I was thinking about doing that with my books because in 2009, I had one book and now I have a lot more books. So I was thinking I might do that. Um, but yeah, have a think about what you're going to do with the last couple of weeks, um, whether you're going to like give a real push to achieve some goals or whether you're just going to chill out and relax. Uh, So today I'm talking about how to effectively work from home with Amanda Brown, the homepreneur. Now I started working from home in 2011 and Amanda's been doing it for 20 plus years. So we talk about some of the pitfalls. Um, Obviously there are huge benefits for working from home, especially if you have a family, as we talked about with um, uh, Andrea last week, uh, I, have, as I've said before, happily child free. <laughs> and there are many benefits from working from home, but it's also a lot of, there's a lot of challenges and you don't really expect them when you make the transition. So wanted to talk about that. Um, also, if you're trying to make the most of of work from home, whether you're part-time or full-time, or if you're thinking of fa- about transitioning, uh, there is a lot to navigate. We, so we talk about physical health, about loneliness, about isolation, cash flow, uh, some of the things um, which affect writers very much. And, you know, particularly like loneliness talked about in The Healthy Writer, physical health. Uh, these are things that are so important. <laughs> uh, also, you have to work on your craft if you're going to do this full time. But you also have to learn a lot of skills around business and physical health. So uh, and in fact, I've had a number of questions recently that have made me very much realise the holes in the education knowledge for uh, writers around business. And of course, I've got my book, Business for Authors, which is still totally relevant, but I, I kind of want to add to it. I want to add chapters around, more chapters around money, investing, pensions, superannuation, and the mindset of intellectual property assets over cash flow income, and also um, books as employees, <laughs> which is something that I know a lot of writers struggle to think. Uh, the metaphor of book as baby, I you know, personally, I find uh, not as attractive as Booker's employee because <laughs> you can't send your baby out to work for you, but you can send your employee out there to make you money. So, uh, yeah, so so many books to write. My plans for 2020 are kind of already filled, but I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I love this business. Always more creative things to come. So in publishing news this week, The Hot Sheet, which is a brilliant uh, premium newsletter on the relevant publishing news for authors, uh, reports on Baker and Taylor returns, uh, which are impacting cash flow for some publishers, and also Amazon's reduced orders because of Black Friday congestion. And they mention, quote, the dependency of the entire publishing ecosystem on Amazon. And the IBPA, the Independent Publishers Association, released a statement 
saying, quote, this event should be a wake up call for publishers to diversify their sales channels, to push consumers to other retailers, to advocate on behalf of local independent bookstores and to be mindful about their own purchasing decisions as we approach the holiday season and beyond. Now, while this is about traditional publishing cash flow, this resonates with my own message of the importance of multiple streams of income. Don't depend on one vendor. Uh, We don't even need to mention the name. Um, don't depend on one vendor for your entire business, for your entire cash flow, because something will change. Um, this is a good example for publishers, you know, suddenly, oh, sorry, we're not going to order this many books or sorry, we're actually returning all this stock. And as I've mentioned, um, in fact, quoting now from publishing perspectives about uh, the Future Book Conference where James Daunt did the keynote. And uh, if you haven't been following along, um, Barnes & Noble in the US was bought by a hedge fund and James Daunt is the CEO, also CEO of Waterstones here in the UK. And um, the article from Publishing Perspective says, seeing Barnes & Noble stores crushed by the corpulent opulence of American business, James Daunt says the chain must, quote, rip out the boring. And, and as I've, you know, talked about with Mike Shatskin earlier in the year, and I've said a number of times, uh, if people look at what James Daunt did with Waterstones, a lot there was a lot of returns. So, um, and the publishing business model very much, you know, is on put these books out and aim not to get a lot of returns. But um, I think the idea of stock, um, which is something that indie authors don't have to do, like we do not have to hold stock, um, is is such a benefit. (laughs) Uh, So anyway, a few things there around the business side of publishing and how that might impact people. I certainly think a lot of authors are going to see these returns impacting on their royalty statements at some point. Um, So yeah, you can find the hot sheet at hotsheetpub.com. It's definitely well worth subscribing to. It is premium, uh, but I find it very useful. Uh, Also from the Future Book Conference, um, uh, Dan Holloway reports on the Alliance of Independent Authors blog. Uh, Some data points. So Data Guy was speaking at Future Book. Um, Data Guy used to be uh, someone who posted uh, on behalf of independent authors. Now he runs a business that essentially works with big data for big publishers. And, you know, uh, there was some people who were disappointed by his move, but clearly he's a businessman. We all understand that. And, um, you know, he makes his cash flow from working with big data and big publishers are more happy to pay for that type of thing <laughs> than indies. So fair enough, you know, fair play to to the dude. Um, but uh, future book. So a couple of tidbits that Dan brought from that presentation. There are big differences between the UK and the US markets. US price points are higher. Book sales sustain over a longer period in the UK. And the big five have only half the market share in the US they do in the UK. So this, there are a couple of things here. Uh, US price points are higher. And I, I keep trying to tell US uh, writers about this. This is also partly because of exchange rates, of course. And this is the problem with um, Amazon advertising that many of us here in the UK are now finding since they opened it up to the US authors. (laughs) You guys are just throwing your dollars around, not realising that we do GBP. And also our book prices are generally... um, lower. But what this does mean, and I think this is going to hit in 2020 is one of my predictions, that the Amazon advertising um, boom amongst indies is going to significantly impact the UK um, store in the same way as it has in the US. Because precisely here it says, the big five have only half the market share in the US, they do in the UK. In the UK, we still have a big dominance of traditional publishing, but I think, um, you know, the US is always ahead of the UK. So this is coming. Uh, Although then it says, the contribution of self-publishing to the UK ebook market is huge. In the past six months, self-published titles and single author imprints, which is what I have, accounted for around £40 million out of a total of £170 million. So what's that, about a fifth? Something like that, yeah. No, more than a fifth. Anyway, lots. <laughs> so, yeah, really interesting and um, certainly good to hear some data points there uh, on publishing. 
So my personal update this week, I basically gave up on Map of the Impossible for NaNoWriMo. I just couldn't get my brain into gear for that. Um, I did about 15,000 words, which is good start uh, and got some ideas for the whole thing. Um, but I, I need to do more research. I'm such a research focused fiction writer that it's just very hard for, for me to go from standing start to finish manuscript. And it's not fun for me either. And at the end of the day, this is about enjoying your writing life. And for me, that research is part of it. But what I did do in the last week is I decided to shift my NaNoWriMo to my non-fiction, nano non-fiction mo, uh, to audio for authors. So I have, uh, I'm nearing 35,000 words on that book. Um, so my plan is to finish that first draft and even the first edit before Christmas. And um, I've got, uh, you know, my, my wonderful, um, assistant Alexandra is going to be a first reader because she's also a podcaster does audiobooks and is a fantastic um other brain for me so uh my aim is to have that done well in fact more than my aim it is now on pre-order <laughs> uh February 10th 2020 is when the pre-order is going out it's uh, the book is called audio for authors audiobooks, podcasting and voice technologies. Now, because I've been learning this stuff all year, the words are seriously flowing out. And I think partly why my NaNoWriMo was not working was because I had started this audiobook before I went to Vegas. Uh, but in fact, before I went to Frankfurt and then I put it on hold and then I went to Frankfurt and Vegas and I got back and it was NaNoWriMo and I tried to start another project. Whereas for me, I'm very much project-based writer. So I need to finish this book in order to uh, open my brain up for the next project, which will be Map of the Impossible. So um, yes, audio for authors. I know many of you keep emailing me saying, when is it coming? Because I've been talking about it for six months. <laughs> but yes, February 10th, 2020, audio for authors. Uh, you can pre-order now. Uh, also, this week, I well, in terms of research, I did um, because Map of the Impossible is going to have quite a lot of Egypt stuff in. Uh, I went to London uh, this week. First of all, my season of sociability has started. This is it's always hilarious because, of course, authors, introverts, spending a lot of time alone, and then at Christmas, everyone comes out, and um, it's much much merriment is had. So I had a bit of sociable stuff, and then I went to the Tutankhamun exhibition at the Saatchi Gallery in London. Now, it was if you if you are not going to go to Egypt, then of course you should see the Tutankhamun exhibition. Absolutely, but I saw the exhibition um one you know it, it, in situ in Cairo back in 2004 and that was when the Cairo museum was still kind of dusty handwritten labels and it it was it was awesome i mean it really was talk about and there are like mummies everywhere and it's very very you know it's still like the mummy in 1920 kind of thing. Uh, but what they're doing is uh, building a brand new museum in Cairo, which also looks like it's going to be incredible. And I absolutely want to go back. But for me, the power of setting was very much brought home to me with seeing this exhibition in London uh, because uh, it, they had this kind of multimedia stuff. It was all very slick. Um, lots of, you know, yeah, just multimedia stuff. Um, but the actual exhibits they're very small you know this is funerary grave goods and they didn't have the big pieces that you see in Cairo the chariots and the gold mask and the stuff stuff they won't let out of Egypt but that is the really impressive stuff <laughs> so I this was interesting it, it, it did give me some ideas for Map of the Impossible I got some great quotes from the Book of the Dead it's always wonderful to have people curate quotes from ancient Egyptian texts, which are very long. Um, so I found some good stuff there. Um, and some, you know, I just found it interesting. It was good to see it again, but it was much more impactful to see it in Cairo. And of course, I've written about, I actually wrote a scene in that room for Ark of Blood, which is my kind of Egypt book. But um, I'm bringing in a different, a different kind of fantasy spin to ancient Egypt in Map of the Impossible. So I really, I had a really good uh, artist state, let's call it. Um, which, if you don't know, Julia Cameron uh, in the artist's way, the artist's state is one of these occasions where you take yourself out on your own and you fill your creative well and you give your mind things to chomp on. 
<laughs> and for me, I, I love museums and uh, exhibits and stuff. Um, so what they, they did do, um, they also talked about the power of character in the exhibition. Um, Tutankhamun as the immortal pharaoh whose name would never be forgotten. And also Howard Carter, the Egyptologist who almost his career was over until at the very last moment he discovered the tomb. Um, if they didn't, I mean, obviously, it, it, there are the the curse of the mummy is very um, sort of popular in folklore, but uh, you know, not necessarily what actually happened. <laughs> But of course, we love all that stuff. But they did have some cool, gruesome pictures of uh, mummies, which is always always a good good fun. And there was a whole load of uh, kids there, <laughs> just like, oh look, they didn't. They were not interested in the grave goods. They were interested in the dead bodies. <laughs> Gotta love kids. <laughs> uh, but it's, it was also proof um, of how absolutely ancient Egyptian stuff still resonates. The cues were incredible and I had a time a time lock on my ticket. And uh, if so if you do want to go, you definitely have to buy tickets in advance. I think these types of exhibitions are, I mean, they, they can be pricey, but they are well worth it for inspiration for stories. And also really just seeing that, uh, you know, they're the ancient Egyptian stuff. It still, still is a powerful symbol in culture. So thanks for all your emails and tweets this week. Cassandra Lee said, I uh, I, fa- I thought your voice double sat really sounded like your audiobook voice. If not for the heads up, I think I would have been fooled. Uh, by the way, I'm a programmer, uh, big in machine learning with natural language and have been following updates about GPT-2. So that was good to hear, Cassandra. Will Brown said your AI voice definitely sounded like you. It would be spot on if they could match the cadence and flow of your speech pattern. Uh, Angeline Trevina said the AI was very clearly your voice, but an obvious AI too. Very, very impressive and a little creepy, but it totally wasn't you, you. It was flat and characterless in comparison. So this is, and this is what's interesting because on the 26th of November, 2019, so only this week, so after I put that out last week, um, The Verge reported that Alexa's voice can now express disappointment and excitement. So this emotional tone that distinguishes or unemotional tone that distinguishes AI voices, this is starting to be cracked. And I am planning on uploading a lot more voice data to Descript for the next iteration of my voice. And what I'm going to do is use all these intros because um, the intros are, you know, I, I've got a lot more of them than my solo episodes. So hopefully the next iteration of it will be uh, more interesting. Now, I, I want to wait a bit on that. I mean, they've already sent me another one, but I want to wait because I want the next one to be even more impressive. So watch out for that uh, in 2020. Uh, Daniel Parsons said, loved your episode on German translation. It's interesting to find out that you can go wide in English and be in KU for translation. I assumed they would both be the same. So this is interesting because I also have had a couple of emails about this. So clearly there's some confusion. So KU, Kindle Unlimited or KDP Select, when you actually go in through the dashboard, uh, you select per book. It is not a blanket decision for your whole Amazon account. So maybe you have three books. You could put one in KU and put two wide or the other way around. So you don't have to be... uh, And of course, a translation you upload as a separate book. It's not the same book. It's a different interior, it's a different cover, it's a different title, <laughs> different language. This is a completely separate book on the dashboard. So I hope that makes sense to people. And that's really, really important uh, that I didn't really realise people were conf- confused about. Uh, and then, oh yes, thanks to RJ Wade Books, who bought the I am creative, I am an author mug and sent a little video. Um, you can find that um, at society6.com forward slash the creative pen, or there's a link on uh, the homepage for um, uh, for the creative pen. <laughs> there's like a merch link. Uh, if you want some mugs for Christmas, uh, lots of creative mugs. We drink out of creative mugs here in the creative pen household. <laughs> Um, what else? 
uh, Hannah says, oh, the interview with Andrea resonated so much. Um, I have four children ages 10 to one. I've learned to be super focused in order to make the most of the time I do have. I've learned to cut myself some slack. When a day passes and I realise I've only written 500 words, I have to remember I'm not an unproductive author. I'm a super productive author who had maybe 10 or 15 minutes of uninterrupted time that day. Uh, Absolutely, Hannah, you're a superstar. And, uh, you know, hats off to everyone out there doing such an incredible job in so many ways. Uh, And then finally, thank you to Tomasthenes, who says, since yesterday was Thanksgiving, I wanted to pause and say thank you for all the research you do and share with us through the books and podcasts. I like your emphasis on technical trends in writing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tomasthenes. I really appreciate that. And uh, yeah, I, I enjoy this. And it's funny because, of course, People ask me all the time, so, you know, why why are you going to continue? Are you going to continue the podcast? And it may well change. I say this every year. I may well change the format. Uh, I may at some point not go weekly um, because weekly is pretty, it's a pretty demanding time frame, really. Um, but I actually love being a curator for information for you guys. I love finding the latest stuff that will help you and will give a perspective on things. I think curation in this very busy world is so important. So, um, also, it's an income stream for me. So, that's also brilliant. And that leads on to our sponsorship. So today's show is sponsored by Findaway Voices, who can give you access to the world's largest network of audiobook sellers and everything you need to create professional audiobooks. Now, of course, um, I love Findaway. They are absolutely brilliant. For a start, they allow global authors to publish. And the problem with the other one is that they are not available to authors around the world. Um, Findaway's goal is to help you take back your freedom with audiobook sales because you can decide your pricing, which other a another service does not allow. And you can also set your price for the retail side and for libraries as well. And that is another important thing. Findaway puts your audiobook into library catalogues. And this is huge because what you can do is tell your readers, hey, readers, you can listen for free. Just ask Uh, your local library to order the book. And with the paper checkout model, it's incredibly reasonable for them. So if you are exclusive uh, to the other service, you cannot be in libraries. And I think this is this is such a big deal. And more and more of my revenue from Findaway is is through libraries. Uh, So thanks to all of you who have ordered my books through your libraries, and you should be able to You can also reach a global audience through Findaway. Of course, you can use it to distribute to Audible and Apple Books, but also retailers like Storytel, which are expanding into all the territories not dominated by Audible, and also Google Play Audiobooks. So in fact, someone emailed me today asking me how to get into Google Play for audio. And indeed, you can get there through Findaway. Also to Kobo Audio, you can sell direct through Authors Direct. Um, That is only in a couple of markets right now, but hopefully they'll be expanding. Plus, you can uh, get on the Chirp audiobook promotion site through Findaway. And in fact, you will find some of my books on Chirp. It is the book bub for audiobooks. And you can't get in if you're exclusive with ACX because you can't set your price. And the whole point of Chirp is it is a um, discounting service. If you'd like to try Findaway Voices, they can also help you find a narrator. Or if you narrate yourself or you do it privately, you can just upload your finished files. They have also announced Voices Share, where the author pays half the normal cost of an audiobook in exchange for 20% of the royalties with the narrator. So if you want to get into audiobooks, now is a very good time. And um, I think Again, many people think, oh, you know, audiobooks have already gone boom. Nope, we are in the very early days of audiobook booming. <laughs> so exciting. I, I just love this business. Uh, yeah, I really do. I was just the other night when I was out being sociable, I was just telling someone about this business model and when the when the penny drops around licensing and around what you create when you write a book, it's just way too exciting. <laughs> Anyway, back to find a way. Take back your audio freedom and publish your audiobooks everywhere with findawayvoices.com. 
So, this type of sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating this show is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. Thanks to everyone supporting the show on Patreon. Thanks to new patrons, Rob Kearns, David Goodin, Ashley Weiss or Weiss and Angel Vane. I really do appreciate your support on Patreon, like the tweets and emails that demonstrates you enjoy the show, find it valuable and want it to continue. And you can support the show with just a couple of dollars a month and uh, less than a coffee a month or a couple of coffees if you're feeling generous and you'll get the extra monthly Q&A and the entire backlist. So you can learn lots more through audio uh, by uh, becoming a supporter. Support the show at patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash the creative pen. And just to, um, because someone asked me about this week as well, just to reiterate um, on some of the economics of podcasting, this show, because of the numbers of downloads, now costs me around 500 to 600 uh, US dollars uh, per month in hosting fees. <laughs> so this is the thing when you are an independent podcaster, um, you pay hosting fees, whereas if you are using a um a podcast service. And obviously this is because I get so many downloads. If you use a podcast service, it might be free, but they can insert their own ads in order to pay for the service. So I, as ever, have chosen to be independent from day one. But what it does mean is the costs for the show continue to grow as the downloads do as well. So I really appreciate your support on Patreon. It does definitely uh, contribute to making this financially sustainable. And of course, uh, some patrons, uh, and there is a constant uh, in and out flow from Patreon, of which I absolutely appreciate why people come in and out as things are useful and not useful. So um, you can, of course, join Patreon for just, you know, a month or two and then leave again, Um, you know, come back in and out whenever you uh, feel like you can afford a couple of dollars, for example. So I just wanted to mention that uh, because, you know, it's not like you subscribe and then you have to pay me forever. (laughs) You can just jump in for a couple of months and then jump back out again. Okay, let's get on with the interview with Amanda. Amanda Brown is the author of Homepreneur, how to overcome the challenges of running a home-based business for optimal work-life balance. She has worked from home for over 20 years as a small business strategist, having previously worked in accountancy and banking. So welcome, Amanda. Oh, hi, Joanna. Thank you so much for inviting me uh, on your wonderful show. It's a real (laughs) honour to be here. Oh, no worries. Well, we've got a lot to learn from you, but let's uh, just start out by telling us a bit more about your background and how you got into being a homepreneur. Well, um, as you so rightly said, I had, like you, had um, a corporate career. I spent 14 years in the city of London in that uh, finance field that people uh, talk about. And I really enjoyed it. I had a great time. It was very sociable. I learned an awful lot. I put the knowledge that I'd acquired in uh, from my degrees into practice. And I was one of the first investment manag- women investment managers in the city of London. So you can tell it was quite a long time ago, (laughs) Um, which it was great. And actually, you know, I know this is slightly off topic, but um, in fact, I was treated really well. You know, a lot of women uh, hit that glass ceiling, but um, I don't think they'd invented the glass ceiling back then. So um, I really enjoyed my time there. Um, But I decided in my mid 30s, quite late then, to um, have children, to start a family. And in those days, when you were in a corporate career, particularly in the city, it was very hard to find childcare. There wasn't the uh, availability of nurseries. Certainly, there were no workplace nurseries. And childminding was in its, um, you know, early infancy. Oh, that's a bit of a pun. Um, and so um, because I'd worked for quite a long time, I decided that I re- was really intentional about having these children. And I was in a position where I uh, wanted to stay at home and look after them. So, you know, leaving my corporate career was a really difficult decision because I wasn't giving it up because I didn't enjoy it. I was giving it up because, as somebody told me, the 
other week. You can have everything, but you can't always have everything all the time. Mm. And I sort of took that on board and I thought, actually, that's really good advice because, you know, I I really wanted to spend time uh, with my children. So I unfortunately, later on, while I was uh, working from home, became a single parent. And that was um, another issue. Uh, So it was quite a it was quite a change being at home. But then I decided that, you know, I wanted to do some work. And in the last 10 years, I have been a business consultant to many businesses, mainly looking at strategy, in particular online marketing strategy. I do lots of training. I do lots of consultancy and I manage people's social media accounts and write their website copy for them. And the longest standing client I have is nine and a half years. So uh, yeah, it's been a long time, which is great. Um, So the development of the Homepreneur brand, which is um, came about as a result of really my love for writing. You know, like so many of your listeners, they are either fiction or non-fiction writers. I joined a writing group, I suppose, about five or six years ago. And I really enjoyed it because I wanted to start a blog. And my corporate writing was obviously quite formal. And I needed to find a style, a style that was much more conversational, was much more engaging. And so I went to writing a writing evening class, which folded and five of us decided we'd write together. So we have been meeting up for the last five years, every two weeks in each other's homes to write fiction. Oh, fantastic. Uh-huh. So we love that. It's great. But Homepreneur is really a website. It's a blog with advice and tips and tricks on how to run a home-based business. And um, 18 months ago, I decided to write a book and uh, that came out back in July. And I'm in the process of writing another book. Ah, fantastic. Which will be out (laughs) shortly. (laughs) So what's interesting, I think, is, and and I had exactly the same thing, you know, similar sort of corporate thing. And when I started blogging, my voice was, you know, same, you know, really businessy, didn't have any conversational tone. And blogging is fantastic for getting into a less formal way of writing, of course. So I totally agree with you on that. But let's talk about the pros and cons of working from home, because I know many people listen. I mean, many people might already work from home, but working from home is often something that people want to do because it gives you more choice. As you say, you can do childcare or, you know, as I am happily child free, I just get to go to my yoga classes and <laughs> do, go for a walk. And, you know, working when it when you are ready to work as opposed to being stuck on someone else's schedule. So um, what are some of the benefits that you have seen from working from home? Because obviously you could have gone back because your children, I presume, are now Uh, older. So, you know, why, why stay working from home? What are the good sides? Um, I think because um, when I was, uh, became a single parent, my children were only 10 and eight. And so actually uh, working from home was really important for me because it meant for the next 10 years while they were still in education, I could uh, drop them off at school, pick them up afterwards. I could Uh, they were old enough that if I needed to do work when they were at home, they understood, you know, mommy has to go off and do um, an hour of work. They were quite happily to play, happy to play with one another. So actually it worked out really well. I think being, um, being in a, a two person in a couple is obviously much easier when you can share those childcare responsibilities. But I think the main benefits of working from home are about really choosing the profitable work that you love. And I put that word in advisedly, and maybe we'll talk about money later on in the, in our discussion. But actually I do think it's having that choice. It's about being in control. It's about being intentional and positive about the level of control that you have, being confident about it. You can design your working day and you can design your environment. And I know from having done a survey that 
people think that they need to have loads of space to work from home. Well, actually, most of us are working behind a computer or on a laptop. So we can pick that up and go and work anywhere in our home. It means you can have a dedicated corner of your sitting room or your bedroom. I don't advise working in bed. Very bad for you, that. <laughs> I know a lot of writers sleeping. who do work in bed, though. <laughs> do they? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, beds are for sleeping and not for <laughs> and other things and not for not for work. It's much better if you work at your kitchen table. And loads of people in my survey wanted to build a shed. The economics of building a shed, I think um the thing was more about, you know, nesting in a shed. That was uh, about decorating. <laughs> oh, well, I have to mention their um uh, travel writer Alistair Humphreys who's been on the show a number of times. He has a shed in his garden which is his uh, writing shed. So, I you know, I know and there's the shed porn website which I know many writers enjoy. <laughs> 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 yeah, sheds are a big thing, aren't they? Yes. Um, I have to stop myself doing things like that. I just get the, I just work out the economics of it um, and, and decide that actually um, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I do have a nice office down here with a view of the countryside outside. So the one thing is about deciding how to con- uh, control your working day as well. And, y- you know, you don't have to, st- unless you're, you know, a writer is very much on their own schedule, but unless they've got a deadline to hit. But for a lot of people who work from home, they are working office hours because their clients are working office hours. So I think that if you're thinking that working from home is going to allow you necessarily to um, maybe work in the evenings, I have a feeling that a lot of people stick to the office hour day. And there's sense in that really, because actually the rhythm of the day is very important to the way our our minds and our bodies work. So that's- mm, I definitely agree with the rhythm of a day. And I think we all have a kind of rhythm, but I also know people in the UK, we're both in the UK, who work with clients in America. So they might in the morning, that may be where they go to the gym or do other things. And then they start work when America gets up. Um, So that type, the time shift, and you know, a lot of people who work from home in inverted commas might be location independent. So I think in this kind of global world, you can have deadlines or all different times and clients at different time zones, right? Absolutely. Yes, definitely. But play to your chronotype, that time of day when you work best. You know, most people um, are um, typically bears. They like to uh, get up when the sun rises. Well, probably after the sun rises in the middle of summer in the Northern Hemisphere and are usually better in the morning. And then you get these people who are a true night owls, but they make up very a uh, few percentage of the population, but do work to the time that you feel best. And that's, that is one of the advantage of, uh, advantages of working from home. Definitely. Um, okay. So what are some of the drawbacks? Because it's not all roses, is it? Definitely not. I think the first thing to consider, and I've got, I've pulled out uh, five things here. Uh, The first one is the fact that you are head of all departments when you work from home. Now, writing is a, a quite a simple business model, but if you're doing something else where maybe you've developed an online course or you're doing consulting or you're combining your writing maybe with some tutoring, you're going to have to do some marketing. You're going to have to do the finances. You're maybe going to have to get to to grips with technology. So you do wear lots of different hats. So I think that is one of the shocks. When I first left the corporate world, I was really surprised at how many different things I had to learn. It wasn't just being a business consultant. I also had to learn an awful lot of other things. And learning can be seductive, but it can also be terrifying. So some people um, will avoid learning things and employ other people to do that difficult task. And then other people, a bit like me, get um, seduced by learning everything and spending far too much time learning and not enough time getting on with things. So Mm -hmm. uh, learning is a double-edged sword. So that would be number one, is having to be all heads of all departments. And there are solutions to that. Uh, 
And the other thing is about surrounds um, decision making. I think decision making is very difficult when you work from home. As human beings, I think we have to make something like, an in, I mean, it's an enormous number, but 35,000 decisions a day. We're choosing all the time. You know, are we hot? Are we cold? Are we um, hungry? Are we thirsty? So all these things are going on. This is actually much harder for fiction writers because uh, as uh, I get very tired when I write fiction because you have to make decisions for your characters and you might be making decisions for lots of characters. So it's in, if people listening, if you get tired writing fiction, this is part of it. You have to. The, the, these decisions take up part of your brain, don't they? So the, you know the best the best thing there is to have systems around your working from home. But yeah, I just wanted to point out that that doing it for characters just kind of compounds the whole thing. <laughs> it is amazing how tiring writing is mm. um, and any type of work where you think, well, actually, you know, what have I done? But And you feel really physically tired. I think that's the thing. Not only do you feel mentally tired, but you actually feel um, quite drained. So decision making is very, very difficult on your own. Because in fact, that that is one thing you do leave behind is the benefit of having a team around you when you work in an, in the corporate world. Um, I would, I would say though, I mean, many of us now have virtual teams. Uh, so like that's, you, know, you can have lots of team members in your publishing team or your, your online business at home. It's just that they might not be physically there. Exactly. And when I come on to the solutions, I will, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. And I think you're so right. Having those people around you to um, help you when you find it difficult to make decisions. Um, so, you know, making decisions, always, if you're making big decisions, again, start them early in the day. Our willpower is much better first thing in the morning. It's like a battery. It sort of drains as the day goes on. Uh, the next drawback um, is if you are a workaholic because um, you will try to work all hours and the life gets in the way of that. So it's one thing being a workaholic when you are in uh, the corporate world, you physically have to go home at some point. Uh, that can be a difficulty. And also at the other end of the scale is the procrastinator so if you are easily seduced by the social media rabbit hole, you'll know what it's like to get onto social media and find an hour's gone uh, by and you've spent all that time commenting on other people's Facebook posts or um, you're on LinkedIn searching for people to uh, connect with. So procrastinators who don't get down to things will find it's worse when there's nobody there to keep you on track or no peer pressure, if you like, uh, that you have in the corporate world. And then finally, I'd say the fifth one is loneliness, which I think we all suffer from time to time. Mm, yeah. And I think that loneliness was something I was quite surprised about because I am an introvert and many listeners are introverts. And uh, so we we naturally think, oh, well, being at a home, home alone all day is going to be brilliant. But actually, uh, it, it can make you quite insular and you might lose, well, you just lose perspective. It's just like, oh, there are other people in the world. So uh, this morning, as we talk, uh, this morning, I was at my cafe, at, you know, sort of 7am doing my writing. And I don't need to talk to anyone, but just to be surrounded by other people makes a huge difference. And I, I've been writing in libraries and cafes, you know, since I started working from home in, in 2011. So any sort of tips for getting out of the house and dealing with that loneliness in particular? Yes, definitely. Um, for a lot of people, networking not only provides them with uh, company, and that can be weekly or monthly, and it can be informal or formal. I write um, a whole chapter about how to network effectively in the Homepreneur book. Uh, but networking has become very, very popular. Business networking um, started with uh, Business Network International in America, and that has hundreds of thousands of members. That's quite a formal group. But then there are local groups that are set up, which are relatively informal. So if you're looking for networking, just type networking and your location into Google and up will come local 
uh, groups that you can go and visit. Now, not networking's not. It's not about it being uh, you being right for the group. It might be that the group is um, not right for you. So go to a few and see how you get on. You know, we don't always um, find the right group the first time round. The other thing is to search on Meetup. That's the platform meetup.com. You can find lots of events to go to both in the day and out of the day. They might not be business related. You might find a badminton group at 12 o'clock on a Tuesday uh, afternoon. That might be a great way of getting out of the, the office and meeting people. There's Eventbrite. That's a good search engine for finding events to go to. Uh, We have locally a great way of working. Uh, It's co-working called a jelly. Have you heard of a jelly? No, but I think co-working spaces are pretty common now around the world. Um, You know, the only thing I, and I go to one as well sometimes, but it it can be quite expensive um, for many, you know, people starting out in uh, working from home. So that's why I kind of recommend libraries and and cafes for writers. Um, Jellies are free. Um, They're usually set up by a local business person. So we have, we have um, a jelly. In fact, we've got one tomorrow at a local research um, institute. We meet in their canteen. Um, It's a combination of work and networking. So that's quite good. That costs nothing at all. And on occasions we meet in the local pub. And that has proved very popular. The other thing is to work from home with someone. So I have I run a thing called Hoffice, which is a contraction of home and office, where once a month people come and work in my kitchen. And that's proved very popular. We get much more work done than when we go out because, in fact, um, I run the Pomodoro technique where we work for 50 minutes and have 10 minutes off. Oh, so that for, for a chat. Of, and actually, that's a yeah. good tip because, you know, uh, you need you need procrastination time. You need social media just for fun. And so I think doing I do that too. kind of right. I need to do this. Uh, like we'll do this interview and then I can check Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That, that so type that, of thing. Yeah. So that office has been going for about 18 months. Sometimes it might be me and one other person. Sometimes I will have a kitchen of six or seven people and we all work together. And it's very much run on, um, it's it's a Swedish idea uh, um, originally. So, mm. and actually I was interviewed by the FT and got my picture of my kitchen in the FT. There was an article about working from home and running a office. So oh, fantastic. That well, that, um, for people listening uh, elsewhere, that's the Financial Times. It's a, a big newspaper in the UK. So um, that's fantastic. So uh, another issue that I found, and it was, you know, it's a classic one, uh, is that uh, because I was, I, I did just work in a corridor in my old flat, you know, I didn't even have a, another room. But because I was at home all the time, I ended up uh, putting on weight. And I also got RSI, repetitive strain injury, within a year of working, you know, working outside of an office. So I I didn't have the commute. I didn't have, you know, people around me, I guess. So, um, and now, you know, years on, I've healthy physical working practices. Um, but what are some of the ways that people can deal with the physical working space so that, and schedule, I guess, so they can maintain that good health? Yeah, I think that's, I, I read your book that you co-wrote. I thought it was a really interesting um, read, the one about the healthy um, writer, the healthy writer mm. because one like you, um, I have actually bad legs. So I'm probably not always the best person to ask. So I have given myself permission, and this is about giving yourself permission, to go to an exercise class during the day. Um this is very hard, obviously, if you, you're trying to squeeze a whole working day into, say, school hours, it's very hard to give yourself permission to take that hour, hour and a half off. Uh, and maybe also walking in in town is not such a joyous thing. It's all right if, like me, you live in a village and you can walk down and walk in the countryside. Um, but it's really important to schedule that into your week. Uh take your children swimming maybe one afternoon after school and that'll help you with your fitness. But it is about being, um, you know, very disciplined and and working from home does require discipline. Mm, I think it requires more discipline as a writer because there's nobody there. There's no client at the end of the phone or there's no deadline necessarily to meet because you're 
you, you, you know, and it's difficult to be disciplined both with your work and your personal life. So I commiserate. I like the idea that you mentioned once, which is to drink lots of water because then you have to get up and <laughs> stretch and visit the bathroom. So that, that is good. And also I wear um, I wear an Apple Watch now and it's great because it buzzes. If you've been sitting down, uh, you have to get up and walk around at least once an hour. And, you, you know, you think when you first start wearing it, you think, oh, you know, I, it won't ever buzz because I'll obviously be getting up and down. But good. <laughs> me sometimes I'm just in the zone and I'm like what it's just buzzed again you know and it's really really good uh, but I agree with you you have to have a schedule and in fact I now schedule I probably scheduled two hours uh, almost every day for physical exercise because um, it's a huge priority for me uh, and most of that is in the the morning as you say so I go and write for a couple of hours and then I go to the gym or um, you know yoga or something like that or go for a walk so it's super important otherwise you're just going to burn out as you said I'm a workaholic. <laughs> Yeah, I think burning out is a, is a real issue. I mean, I garden because I need, you know, sometimes low level exercise. I need some vitamin D getting outside. Well, obviously in the winter, that's a bit of a challenge, but actually you just have to put your coat on, your boots on and, and, and go and do it. The tendency is to go, oh, well, I'll just do another bit. Or, but sticking to that schedule, write down your schedule, write it down on a piece of paper where you can see it. You know, sometimes putting everything digital um, doesn't quite work because you, you know, you don't have your phone with your schedule on it um, right in front of you, a big piece of A4 sitting <laughs> You're there. You're so funny. <laughs> this is a generational thing, I think. I have my phone with me all times. Plus the Apple Watch has my schedule on. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. This is a, you You can be as tech as you like, or you can be as analog as you like. It doesn't matter. We're both saying the same thing, right? Well, exactly. And and I actually, I'm pretty techy, but I've gone back to, I've gone back to, for my daily routine, I write it out the night before I write it out first thing in the morning. And I do, you know, have a pretty strict morning routine. I think if you can do that, it sets you up for the rest of the day. So if you flag because you're tired in the afternoon, then at least your morning has been productive. And it's hard, you know, we're, we don't all get it right all the time. That's for sure. Oh, no, absolutely. But this is also one of the benefits of working from home, I think, is that, um, you know, I quite often, well, I often don't know what day it is, again, because we don't have children. <laughs> and, and we just never, you know, remember what day is what or when the school holidays are or whatever. But, you know, sometimes I might not work on a Tuesday because I want to go do something else or it's a lovely day and we want to go for a walk. But then I'll end up working on a Sunday, for example. So having your own schedule means um, that, you know, or maybe you get sick. And in the past, you might have just forced yourself to go to work because it's not that bad um but now it's like okay do you know what I'm just gonna sleep today or rest or read or or whatever so definitely one of the benefits is managing your schedule but as you say you have to manage your schedule <laughs> yeah definitely yeah. and I know that procrastination is 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 you know I don't struggle with it but I do know a lot of the people who are in my Business Focus Academy, that is what they struggle with. Even mm. if something's going to take five minutes, they will put that particular task off. So, yeah, um, definitely. Well, there's, there's another thing I think around um, boundaries, and this it, boundaries kind of goes into the same thing. Now, when I started working from home, my husband was going to a day job. So he was leaving the house, you know, commuting. Um, so I started doing all the shopping, all the cleaning, all the washing all the household chores because I was the one at home and it took a while until I was like, do you know what? I'm, I'm also working. Why am I doing all of these things? And, you know, we got a cleaner and that kind of thing. And I know that people working from home, maybe especially women that might be too gendered, but you know, uh, there are issues there around boundaries. So how, how do we deal with boundaries with loved ones if they're going out to work and we're at home and, and set expectations around this type of thing? Yeah, I think that's I think that's a very, very difficult one. And I think that, you know, definitely, I think the um, feeling guilty about getting a cleaner is uh, it's a false economy not to have somebody to help you around the house, because actually you're making you're making the world go round by sharing your income with with somebody else. So I would 
definitely, particularly if you are not used to having a cleaner, just give yourself permission once again to get somebody to do those chores because um, it really takes the pressure off. You're not worrying about the fact that the, the house looks untidy or maybe needs a hoover or maybe needs a dust so that would be number one, and it saves you so much time because they're going to do it. They do it for a job. They do it quickly. Mm. The other thing is to do online food shopping. That once again oh, means yes. you're Wonderful. not doing you're <laughs> not doing it at the weekend when you might have children in tow. It means that you have to plan your meals, and not so hot at cooking. Then when you do cook, you double up and use the freezer. So do online shopping that can save you another couple of hours a week. Uh, these things, these things definitely add up. And I think that having that difficult conversation with your partner is really important. You know, whether it's the man or the woman taking on, uh, the roles, I think certainly, um, my children, um, who are in their late twenties. Um, if they were in permanent relationships, they definitely wouldn't let their partner get away with not pulling their weight when it came to either the household duties or even when they have children, the childcare. So I think this is evolving, Joanna. And I think there's, um, the, the future looks rosy for, um, for women who maybe have taken on too many domestic duties and maybe were acting more like their their mothers. So these <laughs> things take a long time to change, um, which is also very interesting. Yeah. And again, uh, I know we have many listeners with uh, same-sex relationships. So this isn't just about um, the sort of male-female gender roles. This is also about who leaves the house. I think that's, to me, that's what it was. It was about yeah. um, the person leaving the house assumes that the person person staying in the house is the one that gets to do all of that stuff. And the, so the conversation is more about, look, just because I'm in the house, I'm still working. And, and also I know in the early stages, that person in the house, as you say, feels guilty because they might not be earning a lot. But the point is you will continue not to earn a lot if you don't get your work done. <laughs> so yeah, you, uh, yeah. you, you kind of have to set the boundaries yeah. before you get successful. You do. And I think this is even harder with, um, with writing because, you know, there may be quite a long lead time before that book gets finished. Whereas if you're in my field, you can maybe do something slightly different to, you know, to, to boost your income. And that, that's important that you maybe earn your 10 pounds or ten dollars an hour that you then give to somebody else to go and um, do some of those chores. I think also with being at home is that you, if you've been on your own all day when the when your partner comes in, you're going to want to share your day what's happened in your story or where you've got to in your nonfiction writing, you're going to want to gabble away to a person who's probably just done a, an hour's commute, has spent all day in meetings, has been bombarded with emails, and they actually don't really want to listen to what you've got to say. <laughs> they want to go and sit in a dark room with a gin and tonic or a cup of tea TV, for yeah. half an hour and just zone out. So maybe picking your time when you talk about any issues you might have around um, how you uh, divide up these chores um, is a good idea. Pick your time wisely when they <laughs> they definitely chilled out. Yeah, absolutely. And also I'd say this is another really important reason to have uh, a network of friends. And yes, it takes time, but um, that that chatting away, that kind of, you know, oh my goodness, I just want to talk to a human. Uh, you, you need to do that with someone else generally um, <laughs> during the day. So definitely well worth um, trying to build that network. So you, do, you did mention money there and you obviously come from a background in finance and one of the other problems for, about working from home is is cash flow. And I, I often feel like what, one of the reasons why many businesses uh, fall apart is cash flow. <laughs> so what, yeah. So what are your uh, thoughts and uh, tips around money management, especially because many people listening, I'd say most people listening do not uh, have a full time business as an author, but they might be in the early stages uh, of thinking about it or maybe transitioning. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of um, 
advice out there which suggests that you need to have a, a cushion. And the advice sort of says you need three months worth of expenses. I think that is over optimistic. I think that if you're considering transitioning away from a corporate um work from the corporate world or leaving a job, you really do need to think about maybe having six months put away somewhere. So planning the transition from full-time work, maybe to part-time work, and then to full-time writing or working from home in some other creative field, it, it does take consideration. Unless, of course, you can rely on maybe your partner's income. And actually, one thing I heard, one piece of advice I rather um, liked was to go around your house and look at or your flat, or look for all the things you no longer use. Are there things in your cupboards that you could possibly sell either online or maybe um, maybe offline, or put it up on a Facebook marketplace, and maybe try and go through your um, precious belongings and build up a fund that way. And I thought that was a quite a good piece of advice. I've got a violin sitting here in the corner that I could actually um, make a few pence out of or a few pounds out of um, if I uh, went to the trouble of um, getting rid of it. So a lot of us have got a lot of stuff that we could maybe um, offload. The other thing is to be frugal. Uh, there's quite a frugal movement out there. So uh, maybe not, not um, obviously not making your life miserable, but just thinking about what you spend your money on. You know, how many, how many pairs of um, black trousers does a girl need? <laughs> Unlimited, of course. I mean, <laughs> just on cash flow, I mean, I always recommend that people have a different bank account, even if they haven't set up a business as such, having a different bank account for for the writing or, or whatever it is, is important too. Do you, I mean, I, I now use Zero XERO for my um, accounting software. What Do you recommend any particular um, software? Yeah, I use Zero too. There actually. we go. <laughs> and I love it. I think um, that is worth every penny. I also use, because I have lots of expenditure as well, I use a piece of software called Receipt Bank. Uh, which you can find, just search Receipt Bank. And what Receipt Bank does is it saves you all that faff of finding and extracting all your receipts and then uploading them or sending them to your bookkeeper or your accountant. It automatically takes the contents of an attachment uh, which has an invoice on it or a receipt on it and it talks to zero. Well, you, you so, know, you can you can just email receipts to zero. That's all I do. If it's if you just email PDFs into zero, um, this extracts photographs and all sorts of other things. So it it's just a little bit more uh, because sometimes people will have paper receipts. So it does the whole whole bang shooting match. So that's how that works, and it it is very good. Mm. Um, you can you can put things like your petrol and all those sorts of things, your fuel on there as well. So there's, I think, zero or QuickBooks or um, there's all sorts of, there's fresh books. There's lots of different apps. There's lots of different options. If people are getting paid in multiple currencies, um, there are sort of sort of bank accounts which are not real bank accounts that's like their bank bank account like that can take receipts in multiple currencies without it charging you lots of money so there's so many different financial solutions to your problems nowadays mm, yeah in fact it was one of the reasons I moved to zero because I have multiple currency PayPal accounts and uh, I can just deal with all of those um, in zero so yeah I highly recommend that just on on um, the other thing that I think a lot of people uh, transitioning from full-time employment to kind of self-employed is, is tax. And um, so when you get paid, you have to put money aside, right? Yeah, definitely. And the other thing that you should also think about are insurances and pensions. And oh, I yes. would <laughs> say that, I would say that the majority 
And, and this is a very worrying situation, uh, particularly, I don't know about the evidence in the US, but certainly in the UK, um, there is an organization called IPSI, which is um, for independent professionals and self-employed. It's a very, very good website. If you want financial information, financial guidance, uh, they have done research to show that of the 4.3 million people who are self-employed and they will be mainly working from home um, do not have adequate uh, pension provision. So when you give up your corporate life where you may have had um, pension contributions taken out of your salary at source it's and also topped up by your employer, that's something you should consider when you um obviously have an income from your your homepreneur uh, exploits. Yeah. And I'm so glad you mentioned that. And it's so funny because I hesitate in talking about stuff like this because I know people are at different levels. And when I left my job in 2011, of course, I had some pension accounts, pension pots in the various yeah. past. But between 2011 and 2015, I did not pay into a pension because I just didn't feel like I was making enough money. And then um, my husband, uh, when we when he left his job to join the business, he was like, the first thing, why do you not have pension accounts. We need to do this. And I think it, you often feel like, well, I can't do that because I don't have enough money to live on. But even if you open an account and just start putting £10 in or $10, at least you have it open. <laughs> and then you yes. put a percentage in over time. And now, you know, now I, I we put in a lot because I'm aware that I missed a few years and I want to make that up, which is obviously harder. So definitely something to really think about. Of course, everyone listening is might be in a different country. So we can't give you Obviously, we can't say what you should put that in, but every country has some kind of self-managed pension options. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, most of the websites like the um, HMRC website or the websites in the US and also the banks will give you lots of information about where you can find out the most tax efficient way of saving money. And, you know, I'm not a financial advisor. I come from a finance background, but um, there is, there's a lot of information out there and it is worthwhile spending a bit of time not burying your head in the sand about it because it's not going to go away. That's the, that's no. one thing for sure. <laughs> Unless you um, die, so you don't yeah. want it to go away. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then, then there's other issues. But, um, you know, actually it's really important to just, just tackle it up front. And, you know, saving is just like spending. It's a habit. And if you can put that, that habit into practice, and as you so rightly say, Joanna, at the beginning – you know, start with a small amount and you do not need a financial advisor, although you may wish to get one in order to be able to do this. There are ways, certainly in the UK, and I'm, I guess it's the same in, in the US where you can do this, um, in, in a safe way, uh, just by, um, doing some research yourself. Absolutely. Um, great. So this has been fantastic. Where can people find you and everything you do online? Um, well, the easiest way to find me is to um, look me up as Homepreneur. You can find uh, the book on Amazon. Just put Homepreneur into Amazon. It was good, that title, because it just comes up, which is great. Uh, you can find the website with lots of advice and tips and tricks, uh, www.homepreneur.co. That's just .co. You can find me on Twitter, Amanda underscore Brown, and feel free to email you. And I'm sure Joanna will put that uh, in the show notes. Indeed, everything in the show notes. Well, thanks so much for your time, Amanda. That was great. Thank you. Lovely to speak to you, Joanna. So I hope you found the interview with Amanda interesting if you're considering working from home or if you do already how you might be able to improve things. So next week, I'm talking about the key to long-term success as a writer with Kevin J. Anderson. Now, Kevin's been on the show before. He uh, is fantastic. I always enjoy talking to him as he has made a living as a writer for over 30 years. And we talk about the importance of if you want a lightning strike, 
spend time planting lightning rods. And again, Kevin is a huge fan of multiple streams of income. And like Chris Rush and Dean Wesley Smith, he brings the perspective of someone who has seen a lot of upheaval in the publishing industry, someone who has been through um, busts and, you know, ups and downs in his own business, writing life. And uh, we talk about a lot of those things. And as ever, it's uh, a great, fun and interesting conversation. So happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time. <laughs>